after going to the first AI workshop that I went to, it became evidently clear that everything that I've spent the past 20 years becoming an expert at was somewhat meaningless. Welcome to the AI for Creative Entrepreneurs podcast, where we guide you through the weird and wonderful landscape of artificial intelligence. I'm Kira Hug, co-founder of the Copywriter Club, and the goal here is to help you stay ahead of the curve. This show is all about helping you use new AI tools to maximize your creativity, simplify your work and life, and reinvent your creative career so AI works for you, not against you. So whether you're a copywriter or a marketer or a creative professional of any kind, join us as we explore the intersection of AI, creativity, and career. While copywriters, creatives, and thought leaders are using AI to create way more content, many of us are missing the biggest opportunity that exists today, AI's ability to generate an entire business from start to finish. Today's guest on the AI for Creative Entrepreneurs podcast, Teddy Garcia, sets us straight and helps us see the shift many of us could make into embracing a new identity as a software developer. Now, if you're like, yeah, but I'm a writer, I'm a creative, I'm not a software developer, you're not alone. I've echoed that same sentiment. But I do encourage you to listen to Teddy's vision of what's possible for all of us with these new AI tools at our fingertips. Teddy Garcia is a virtual CTO to some of the world's top authors, speakers, coaches, thought leaders, including uh, one of my mentors, Todd Brown. He's also an expert at marketing automation, funnels, crypto, the Enneagram, which I love, as well as an author, a speaker, a coach, and a direct response marketer. In this episode, we will talk through the seven key buckets of AI tools every business needs to consider from data processing to personalization to predictive analytics and more. And we also can't help but talk about the matrix and Teddy's predictions about the future of humanity. No big deal. You won't want to miss this episode, so definitely check it out. Before we jump into our interview, this podcast is sponsored by our AI course for copywriters and content writers. It's a course slash adventure. We've had over 200 writers and creatives jump into the course already to just figure out how to navigate through this new space, how we can pull different tools and um, how to use these tools, which ones are the best tools, which ones will actually help us do the work that we need to do. Um, and how we can use them in our client work and client projects and how we can use them in our own businesses to think differently about how we're showing up in the world and how we can put together offers and think about our business growth in the future. So there are lots of things included in here. I'm just going to share the link so you can check it out um, and find out everything that's included. The most important part is that Rob Marsh is wonderful at keeping it up to date because the biggest challenge in this space right now is that tools are constantly changing and there are hundreds of new tools every single day. And so our job right now is to keep it up to date so you can work from and learn what's happening today. And also we have a certification inside the course that is available to you if you want to get certified as a prompt engineer, which is definitely a skill set that is going to be more and more important as we move forward. Again, you can learn about this course at thecopywriterclub.com forward slash AI 4C. Okay, let's kick off our episode with Teddy. All right, Teddy, why don't we start with looking at the big picture? And, you know, you mentioned to us last week when we were hanging out that many of us are missing the forest for the trees and focused on the wrong part of the AI conversation. So can you just set us straight? (laughs) Sure, sure. Yeah. So I think what I see, obviously, in the marketing author, coach, speaker space is everybody, you know, trying to utilize AI to create more content, create more copy, more offers, more ads, basically all the creative writing parts of of AI, right? And what I see that really became a, a clear epiphany is like, there's no need to stop at that and that that's really only kind of one piece of the puzzle. 
Whereas if you really start thinking about AI's ability to generate entire businesses from start to finish, right? So coming up with the idea for the business, researching the market opportunity, coming up potentially with, you know, an investor proposal to raise money for the venture. And then, you know, in the middle of that is creating the marketing and, and the copy and all that. The other part where I think people are missing the boat is, is thinking of AI as virtual workforce, right? So the stuff that you used to go to Upwork to hire somebody from the Philippines or Eastern Bloc or wherever from, whether that's programming or design or copywriting or whatever, you know, you can now kind of build through prompts, like little AI workers, right? That will be specialized in a specific task that can be chained together uh, and even have an AI project manager managing those AI workers, right? So you really have, when you think about it, you really have this huge army of virtual workers that will work 24 seven for free, you know, pennies, whatever. Uh, and the question is like, you know, what, what problems do you want to tackle with that sort of workforce? Right. Um, and so I think that, you know, just tackling marketing copy or creative problems is just, you know, fingertips worth of what's, what's potentially possible. So moving from the idea of creating offers to creating businesses, uh, I think is something that people should be thinking more, more about, uh, and how they can spin those up quickly and rapidly, especially with, you know, utilizing a lot of the no code tools and the fact that, you know, AI can basically create software for you. I, I think that's the big shift, right? I think the, the big shift is going to be like WordPress did to publishing that allowed anybody to kind of create a website or a blog and kind of speak their mind. AI is going to do that same thing for software development, right? So anybody that has an idea for a business or a piece of software uh, will be able to make that a reality without having to hire a huge development team and understand coding or, or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. I'd love to jump into some specifics here because I think at one level, it's pretty easy to see how AI can help with content and maybe even an entire information business. But when we start talking about, Hey, it can even help you build software. Uh, you know, I'd love to, to kind of chunk it out how we, how we might do that. So let's say that I have an idea for a new journaling application. I want to run it maybe on mobile phones. So, you know, I've got to have it on iOS. I've got to have it on Android. Um, you know, maybe there's also a desktop version of it. How would I use AI tool? And, and I'm not a programmer. But I just have like this idea in my head that I think it, it would be better than what's out there. So how would I use, and, and I know we're also probably talking beyond chat GPT. You're like, how would I use those AI tools to start to think through like, how am I going to build that business? Yeah. So the first thing I would do would actually be to go to ChatGPT and be like, look, here's what I'm looking to build, right? I, I want I want an application that is going to do X, Y, and Z. Tell me what I should be thinking about in order to build that sort of application. Help me think through some of the requirements that will be needed, you know, user login, payment, whatever, right? And, and in some cases, when you're doing stuff like this, in some cases, the, the more vague you are about what you give it, the better the response you'll actually get back, right? So you might, you know, you might start with a prompt of, you know, you're an expert software developer and chief technical officer, or whatever. I want to build this application. Please help me pick a language. Please help me flush out the requirements. Please help me tell me how long it should take, like all that kind of stuff. So that would be the first thing, right? And then the second part would be diving deeper on the requirements, like as it's flushing out the requirements. Okay, like what are the user login features? What are the payment features we need? What do what does the application need to do? What systems will it need to connect and interact with? Um, and then once you have that requirements document, now you can still go back to it again and be like, okay, so uh, you know, can you help me code the the user login part, right? And it can literally spit back the code that you need now. What I will say is once it start once you start asking it for code, that's where you kind of need to know programming a little bit to know whether the code is right or not. But there's also a, a proliferation of tools available now 
so like for the scenario that you just just described where it would be a mobile app and potentially a desktop app there's an application called flutterflow.com which i would highly recommend people check out it's kind of like click funnels for for app building to a certain degree and so that would be a, a good place to start right for just drag and drop and and even like the the other part that used to be hard about designing apps was like the user interface right and now there are tools there's a couple different ones but uh, uizard, U-I-Z-A-R-D.com is one as well, where basically you can just say, hey, I need a mobile app screen that looks like Instacart, right, to, to pick items for, for to add to a shopping cart, right? Or I need, I need an interface like Uber that has a map, and right? So you can basically describe what you want the interface to look like or what, it, what you want to do. And because those UI UX patterns have now kind of become fairly standardized, like it can generate that on the fly uh, in a way that's editable, that you can tweak it and give it to a designer um, and even kind of build kind of quick prototypes just by linking screens together and be like, okay, well, this is, this is kind of how I want it to flow, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, so that's a perfect example of just like, okay, I've got this idea. Now what do I do with it? And I recently, yeah, I, I'm telling you that I know that this works because I've recently done it for a couple of projects, even though I know how to program and build apps, like, uh, you know, because I'm not, I've been more of a PHP programmer. So I knew I was going to need Python or stuff like that. And I didn't know like, with, you know, there's 50 different Python and JavaScript frameworks and all that. And I was like, all right, I'm not up to date on that stuff. So help me, help me choose a path uh, to go down so that I can potentially find the right developer in these frameworks or whatever. Super I love helpful. that process because I, I feel like that's where I've been stuck, where it's like, I've got an idea, but now I've got to get my idea out of my head and to a designer. And even the stuff, you know, like having having a tool like ChatGPT to reflect back and say, okay, well, do you even want a login process? Oh, yeah, I didn't even think of that. Of course, I need to log in, right? Or, you know, how do you set that? So just having that reflect back, it feels like, I mean, as you're introducing the idea of, you know, seeing the forest for the trees, like all of this stuff that we used to have to figure out before we would talk to an investor, before we start programming, we can get that stuff done on our own, maybe in an afternoon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like I was saying, you know, last week at, at our, at our mastermind, the, the reality is, is that everybody is now going to be in the software business to, to some degree, right? So whether, whether we're building applications or whether we're packaging our knowledge uh, and our expertise and our information into an application or an API that people can use to tap into that specific expertise that we have, like I'm pretty sure that's going to be the future, right? So whether that's you're packaging yourself into a chat bot or again, something like an API that gets called um, to either, you know, extract your unique flavor of content, uh, copy or skill set, whatever, right? So like for me, it could be like I could train a model that's very specific to my knowledge of say how Infusionsoft works uh, and how I build campaigns in Infusion. And then somebody could ask that instead of asking me. Uh, and they can pay for a certain amount of time to access that bot for that information instead of taking up my time to do it. So I think that's, I think that's where we're headed uh, in terms of all of us. I know I showed the, uh, I showed the picture from the matrix of, of the, of the power center that kind of freaked Kira out a little bit. But, you know, yeah. <laughs> oh, I was going to ask you about that later. Don't worry. <laughs> well, let's keep it, let's keep it basic and talk about API and just like, what is an API for people who don't know? Yeah, so an API is basically just an application programming interface. Uh, so, you know, ChatGPT, essentially when you're using it, is an API, meaning the user interface that you're seeing is just a chat box, right? But every time you hit submit, that is calling the open AI API. It's sending it a question, it's receiving back a response, and it's just putting that into a chat window. And so, you know, whether you did that through the actual chat interface or whether you did that through code, you would get the same results because they're both doing the same thing. So APIs are basically endpoints um, into any sort of application or database uh, to be able to push information in or get information back out is the easiest way to explain it. So I know you're not necessarily a mindset coach, at least, I don't know, maybe, maybe you are, Teddy, it wouldn't surprise oh, me. Okay. <laughs> but I'm wondering, you know, what you would say to a copywriter who's like, okay, Teddy, this is cool, but I'm not a software developer. 
I'm a writer. Like, how am I supposed to make this this mindset shift? How am I supposed to grapple with this? So I guess part of me is wondering, have you had to kind of work through any of those struggles? Um, it would be a different struggle and what you'd recommend to creatives that are listening. They're like, I've never thought of myself as a software developer. This is this is a lot to handle. Yeah. Well, so I, I think it's a couple of things. I, I think after going to the first AI workshop that I went to, it became evidently clear that everything that I've spent the past 20 years becoming an expert at was somewhat meaningless, right? Like, like, like Chad is kind of capable of answering a lot of the questions that people used to come to me for. And it also became clear that the opportunity to play in markets that I previously would not have attempted to play in uh, because of the amount of either knowledge or expertise or content that would have to be created to play in a bigger market. Um, you know, let's say something with animals, right? Like, so like, like dog training or something like that. Like I'm not a dog training expert, but, but now I don't have to be. Like I could go into that niche if I wanted to be. Uh, and still come up with enough content to build a list and then find affiliate offers or create offers or, or, or whatever. So just that understanding of the world is now your oyster, right? You can, you can now go into markets that you couldn't go into before. The question I think for copywriters will be like, look, if your skill is creating high converting copy, um, at some point you're going to have to ask yourself, do you still want to do that for clients or are you willing to do it for yourself now? Right. And, and go after the big markets of health and wealth and finance, whatever. Um, and just create your own offers, right. Or start building your own list because you now have this tool that can help you crank that stuff out at scale and compete, you know, with any of the big boys. So it becomes a matter of like, what are you going to say no to? Like there was, there was, there was definitely a, a come to Jesus of, okay, I need to kind of stop taking on client work if I really want to harness this opportunity. And I feel like, I feel like it is a very limited window of opportunity before it becomes table stakes for everyone. I think right now it's still a competitive advantage for those of us that are watching this stuff and actively working with it. But I think it's like a six to 12 month window tops and first mover advantage is a key, right? So you know, I've definitely cut back on the amount of clients that I'm, I'm not taking on any new clients. I'm trying to kind of weed out the ones that I am working with just so that I can focus on all the different ideas I've got going on in my head that, you know, like, uh, I think we talked about it, you know, like I've got 300 domains, right? <laughs> Each one of those domains had a good idea behind it when I bought them, right? Now I could literally execute all, all 300 of them. of them all 300 not not all 300 at once but like the thing that was stopping me from creating the content for them or the offer for them or whatever like those limitations are now gone so uh, Ted, teddy you said something that's really interesting to me you're not the first person to say this but all of the skills you've been building for the last 20 years are now at some point or some level mostly obsolete and that's probably not entirely oh, true no, he said meaningless or mean sorry meaningless yeah yeah. obsolete, meaningless, whichever. I know there are a lot of copywriters, content writers who are feeling the same thing, creatives, designers that are, you know, are feeling programmers, of course. So knowing that, you know, that at least some portion of these skills that we've spent a lot of time developing can be offloaded to an AI, what are the skills that we need to be building so that we're the ones using the AI instead of getting, you know, trampled by by the army of people who are taking advantage of it yeah so I, I you know I think the benefit that copywriters uh, and and creatives have is still the ability to so for copywriters it's obviously the understanding of language in general right like understanding how sentences should be structured understanding uh, strong verbs understanding the use of prepositions like all the stuff that goes into English and grammar uh, you know like to some degree like 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 English lit majors are finally going to have an advantage in the world, right? Because we've been waiting a long time for this day. <laughs> like, English lit majors unite. Yeah. yeah. Because they'll be able to, you know, craft better prompts. Right. So I think, I think what the focus will be on how do we take the skills that we have about language and linguistics and persuasion and all that kind of stuff to, to get the AI to generate what it is we're trying to get it to generate versus 
you know, we're focused currently on the output of like, well, okay, we need to deliver a sales letter for the client. AI needs to be focused on the output. We need to be focused on what's the input that's going to get the AI to produce the best output and do that in a repeatable, scalable way. Uh, I also think for the research process um, that, you know, that can be one of the most time consuming and laborious parts of, of any new project, especially if you're going into a niche you know nothing about, I think AI can speed that up dramatically. And like I was mentioning to you before, like, you know, I was working on a, on a unique mechanism and I basically just told chat like, okay, here's the basics of, of why this is different. And it was like three or four sentences. Right. And then I had it tell me like all the other reasons why it was different compared to the most common methods for solving this particular problem and what it came back with, like I would have never thought of, uh, would have taken me hours of research to, to kind of find those correlations and, and extract from, you know, just a short paragraph that I gave it, like, you know, all this scientific reasoning why my method might work better than, than other methods. It's, it's just mind blowing. So it sounds like, okay, let me know if I have a straight, but it sounds like there are many pathways we can take right now. But one that we've been talking about more so on this podcast is like, you could become a prompt engineer using your language expertise as a writer to mm -hmm. help clients in that way. And then the one you're presenting is really, you, you didn't say forget that, but focus on the opportunity, create your own offers, focus on launching these businesses and possibly selling these businesses. Um, and not necessarily using a skill to serve clients, but like going all in because we have a six to 12 month window to do that. Am I, am I getting it right? Like, yeah. I'm trying to make sure it's clear in my mind. Yeah, I, I think there's an opportunity to build lists quickly right now by, you know, thinking of the bigger niches uh, that, that are available. And, you know, because a lot of us are, are stuck either in a small niche in health supplements or small niche in wealth, uh, you know, crypto or options or, or whatever. Right. But again, like you have the opportunity now to, to build that that same list that Agora's or boardroom or whoever is doing. Right. And as we know, they're typically slower to adapt to to some of these things. Right. So the, the opportunity to to capture some market share quickly and build a list that you monetize through a variety of different ways, whether it's affiliate offers, whether it's your own offer, whether it's software offers, um, you know, there's, I think there's lots of different ways that you can figure out how to monetize it. But I also think that you need to understand that where we're headed is where none of this stuff is going to matter. Meaning we're, we're headed to a place of hyper-personalization. We're headed to a place where literally ads copy sales messages offers and deliverables are generated on the fly in a hyper personalized way specific to that user and so you know i know i'm already working on stuff like that uh where it's something based not only on your on your personality type but whatever i can find out about you on a social graph and whatever you tell me through uh, a quiz uh to be able to generate an actual sales message for you on the fly using good copy framework structures and also generating the offer on the fry. Meaning like if you told me on the quiz that you're more of a visual learner, then it's going to be a video course where if you tell me you like to read, it would be a, a book offer, right? But that could change dynamically on the fly. I don't have to be creating different sales pages. Like I'll let the AI generate exactly what needs to be said to you to get you to buy. And then also, be able to actually generate the deliverable dynamically on the fly specific to you, uh, which is already possible, right? Like everybody's kind of already potentially played around with some of the AI tutors and the, like literally you just open up chat and be like, Hey, I want to learn about X. Teach me like I'm a five-year-old or teach me like I'm an expert and I only want to know what I don't know, like whatever level of granularity you want to learn at, whatever style of learning you, you want to, you know, whether you want it to be experiential or there's worksheets and exercises to fill out or whether it's just high level concepts that are being taught to you, like you can customize the training exactly how you want it to be. Uh, and so we're able to deliver offers like that now as well. That again, can all just be generated in one fell swoop in real time. Not quite there yet, but I think certainly in the next 12 months we'll be there. Yeah, it's crazy to think how how quickly it's changing and the ability to 
you know, be hyper personalized uh, is amazing. One of the things you talked about when we were together last week, Teddy, was how you're using AI with Zapier in order to do just production stuff and to take work off of your plate that, you know, used to take an hour or two of somebody on your team to to do things. Will you talk about a couple of those processes and how you're using different AI tools uh, to make yourself more productive outside of creating businesses or creating marketing? Yeah. So, so what, what I did, um, what I talked about last week was kind of just, there's so many AI tools being released every day, right? There's literally been a couple thousand released since January and there's probably 200 a, a day being released as we speak. Uh, a lot of them focused on copy or image creation or, or stuff like that. But the reality is, is I kind of see seven big buckets of tools that any business is going to need to have. Uh, and so when you're looking for tools, like you should be thinking about like, which of these buckets does this tool go in? And, you know, I only need one or two tools in each bucket. That doesn't mean that new tools won't be coming out in the future that might replace what I currently have. But so the, the first set of tools, which is where kind of Zapier and Make um, and Pabbly and, and things like that kind of fall into is kind of the processing bug bucket, right? It's moving data from one place to another place, basically, and potentially transforming it along the way. Um, so the example that I shared was we use fireflies.ai to record all of our team meetings. And as soon as that team meeting is done, fireflies generates a transcript. That transcript gets pulled into Zapier. Zapier then does some processing of it. It sends it to chat GPT in small chunks. So that, you know, if it's an hour long meeting, it has to break it up into smaller sections due to the amount of characters that chat can work with at a given time. And so it goes through and it kind of summarizes the meeting little by little, and then it generates a complete summary and list of action items for each team member on the meeting just from the transcript. And then it emails it to emails it to us and it posts it to Slack, right? So that's a pretty simple idea of, of an automation. But, you know, there's lots of different things that you can do with those tools, like I said, to kind of move data from one place to another and kind of process it. Uh, and so those, those are the key tools that you're seeing being used right now, Zapier, Make, they're just very simple, no code tools for, for transforming that stuff. So that, that'd be one example of a bucket of tools. The second set of tools would be kind of prediction oriented tools, right? So this is where now we're, we're using different tools to analyze data, um, to help us predict future customer behavior or market trends, right? So uh, it could be, you know, monitoring sentiment analysis of Bitcoin on Twitter, right? To see if there's more buzz coming up around it. It could be looking at your customer history and having it identify customers that might be ready to churn, right? Because they're, they're kind of getting up to that period of time where most customers churn and they haven't logged in in three months, right? It could be looking at all these variables that we don't have to tell it what variables to look at anymore. That's the thing. Like we're moving from everything we used to have to do logic wise or marketing automation wise was, was if then type logic. Like we had to specify if this happens, then, then do this. Now we're not going to have to do that anymore. Now you can just feed the AI a set of data and it can draw its own conclusions and start making those decisions for us, right? So, you know, going back to the hyper-personalized uh, thing, like, you know, the, the days of putting together a linear campaign in email campaign in Infusionsoft or active campaign, that's probably going away too, right? Like you'll be able to feed the AI enough samples of emails that you, you've written that it'll understand your voice and can generate copy that sounds like you. And then it will determine, Hey, this customer is about to churn. Let me put together a sequence for him. And I know that he typically opens emails on Mondays at noon. So that's when I'm going to send them versus, you know, Rob opens Thursday afternoons. It's, you know, it's 5 PM central time. And so like that sort of thinking through will, will definitely start happening. Will that, just, will that just be baked into the email service provider, their platform? Yeah. Yeah. There's a couple of them already that do it as with anything else in our world, like enterprise gets it first. So retention science is one that's actually been doing it for a number of years. I actually spoke about, I spoke a lot about a lot about this stuff back in 2016 at 
at the last MFA live. And at that time I was showing off certain tools that, that already did the stuff that were just out of our reach. But so that's one of them, retention science. Um, there's a new one. So a lot of them are focused on e-com, right? Cause it's a lot easier for e-com to, to use this stuff because it's got more products it can recommend, right? It knows when you're ready, more ready to buy or, or replenish a purchase, um, that kind of thing. So, um, so that's where you'll start to see a lot of them, but that's the basic theory, right? Is like, it will know, it already understands that there are customer reactivation campaigns, that there are customer nurture campaigns, that there are, uh, you know, appointment rescheduling campaigns, right? And it would just be able to react to each individual customer's behavior and generate the right campaign for that person at the right time. So the, the seven the seven types, right? Processing, prediction, production, promotion, personalization, prescriptions, and programming. So we talked about processing and prediction. Production is what most of us are using AI for now, which is just producing content and copy and creatives and images and videos and all that kind of stuff, right? And so there's a whole whole host of tools uh, that you can use from Jasper to, you know, you know, John Benson's working on a, on a new tool for copy. There's tools like Pictory and, and other things for creating videos. There's beautiful AI for creating slides, like all that, all those asset type things can now certainly be auto-generated. We're going to get to the point, obviously, where complete feature length movies are being generated just from prompts like that's coming so yeah so it's gonna be gonna be crazy from the production side and then the promotion stuff is just using ai to really optimize the the message delivery like getting the message out into the marketplace so you know kind of like what buffer does now in a more manual process of just syndicating your content out to all the social media sites or you know replicating videos out to different video sites there'll just be more of that as well as automated like ad management um that can you know turn on ads on or off based on you know either performance goals or the weather like you know a variety of different factors that it can use to optimize the promotion stuff personalization stuff we talked about. So this is more about just the crafting the unique experiences. And like I said, I think, I think that's where, I think as marketers, that's where we're going to see the next wave of tools, right? So the first wave of tools was certainly all the copy and creative stuff. I think the next wave that we're going to see a lot of is the personalization stuff, right? Like, you know, a version of click funnels that creates pages for you on the fly or Again, I think quizzes will allow you to, to drive generic traffic and sort and filter it on the fly with, with a hyper-targeted offer specifically for that person. Um, so I think that's that's kind of where that's headed. And then the, uh, the prescription stuff is kind of what I was saying in terms of the personalized deliverables, right? So whether that is uh, delivering a personalized course specific for that person that only that person is going through that course and it's a custom kind of AI chat thing built just for that person to using AI for support uh, and like concierge type services, right? Where it knows, it knows your knowledge base. It knows all the content that you already have in your library of content. It can guide people to, to the right place. So like wisdom AI in our space is starting to do that where, you know, people that have been using searchy to, uh, host all their videos. All those videos are already transcribed. And so it already has all the content it needs to build a specialized chat bot. Um, so that's already kind of happening. So I think you're just going to see more of that um, on both those fronts, right? Just like, it's kind of the holy grail that we've always wanted, right? It's like, how can, how can we deliver one-to-one -one coaching at scale uh, without it being a complete time suck, right? That's, that is now possible. And then the programming stuff is, you know, the different tools that you could use, low code and no code tools like, like Bubble, like Flutterflow that you can use to start building software applications quickly, easily without being a programmer, um, whether they're internal tools or external tools, right? So, because uh, there's a lot of internal tools that can be built as well to just streamline business systems and processes and, and stuff like that. Like, you know, this whole idea of that we've, again, another holy grail that we've all, hey, everybody's got to have SOPs for every aspect of their business. Well, you know, now you can have chat, create the SOP really. Uh, and then you can build a software tool 
using chat that would uh, enforce that SOP or carry out that SOP. Um, right. And so it's just a matter of kind of getting your head around some of those tools and, and being clear on what your, your, your business processes are and how you want those things executed. I know that was a lot. <laughs> it, it is a lot. I wonder what you think is most critical. So if we all have access to these same tools and so we, you know, we can all offer the coaching, uh, on wisdom and create these apps and tools, like what is going to differentiate, what is going to help, you know, the copywriter club over a competitor in the space? Yeah. So, I mean, for copywriters specifically, um, it's definitely going to be gathering all the samples of your work, right. And, and starting to train a specialized version of, of AI, uh, based on your specific style of, of writing, uh, or, you know, the specific rules that you follow or the specific frameworks that you follow, um, you know, that kind of thing. So whether you're following like Todd's E5 method or, you know, John Carlton's style or Dan Kennedy's or Gary Halbert style, like whatever, like what, what is, what is the model that, that you adhere to when, when you're writing copy manually? Uh, like how do you, how do you, combine that with your unique uh, style of, of writing so that it can generate copy for you, whether again, it's for clients or for your, for your own offers, like data will be key in this world. Um, so if you're a copywriter, uh, an author, speaker, coach, expert, uh, thought leader, it's going to be gathering all of your content, all of your videos and getting them all transcribed, all of your podcasts, like anything that you have, that can be transcribed should be transcribed into text because again, we're dealing with large language models that work on text. That's how they're trained. Uh, and that's how they're queried. So the more text samples that we can feed it of things that we've said, uh, the more it can start to, to kind of replicate us and, and be more like us. Um, so yeah, so for building like that, you know, that unique version of you that somebody could chat with or interact with and ideally get it to answer questions as close to the same way that you would, um, that's what's going to be required is really gathering all that data, digitizing it in a format that, uh, that can be either fed to a model uh, or queried uh, in a database, things like that. So Teddy, as we've been talking, we've mentioned a few tools, uh, wisdomai.com, we, we got ChatGPT. My question really is with so many new AI tools coming out every day, there's no way anybody's going to know them all. <laughs> and so many of them are copycat, you know, have the same positioning, do the same thing. There's got to be at least 30 out there that promise to write your emails in 10x the amount of emails you can write, that kind of thing. But I'm, I'm curious, like, what is what is the Teddy Garcia list of absolute must have AI tools? Or if, if there isn't a list like that, how do we determine the right set of tools for us? I am learning as fast as everybody else is. There's probably 250 tools that I think I went through to find 10 that I really thought were promising. And I think a lot of that is, is a personal flavor thing, right? It's like, like which tool can you sign up for and start using the quickest? Right. Like, I think, I think at the end of the day, that's the thing we got to realize is that they're tools. Right. And so there's a huge learning curve to a particular copywriting tool or whatever, then it's not going to be a useful tool. Right. The more that we can get in there and start getting the results from it, the quicker, the better. So, you know, I've literally been signing up for every trial and every wait list and all that kind of stuff, just hoping to get access as soon as possible. You never know what is going to come out tomorrow that is radically different and better than the tool you kind of already decided on. So I would say two things. Number one would be, you know, continually trying different tools and just figuring out like which tools are the most intuitive to you kind of off the bat. Like, you know, again, they are tools, right? So our job is to be able to use them, um, not have to spend days or weeks learning how to use them. Right. So number one, if you already have a tool that you're comfortable with, that's producing the output that you want, then maybe put some blinders on because there's definitely a lot of bright, shiny objects right now uh, in the tool and software arena. But if not, or if there's something that, you know, that is a big part of your business that you really want to make sure that you're constantly using the most 
cutting edge version of it um then you know looking at sites like product hunt or uh there's an ai for that uh or future tools.io like all all, all of those kind of guys that are building these directories of of the apps as they come out um and just you know try them out try them out quickly and rule them out quickly right is kind of kind of what i would say like there's a there's a seven day trial like sign up for the trial play with it does this make sense to me? Is it better, easier, faster, cheaper, whatever than what I'm already using? Um, or does it fit in my toolbox? Right. So just like, you know, just like you wouldn't keep buying socket sets over and over when you already have the same set of sockets to, to fix a car. Um, it's kind of that same methodology, right? You just want to want to find the tools that, that we can use and be most effective with. But given how fast everything's changing, it does require a little bit of experimentation, fortunately. So what you said earlier caught my attention as far as you letting go of some of your client work and really focusing on creating your own offers and pursuing the 300 domains that you currently have. <laughs> Can you just share, I mean, maybe you can't share the exact offer you're working through right now, but can you just kind of share your thought process when you're looking, starting with the 300 domains, 300 decent ideas and where you go from there, identifying the best opportunity. Yeah. So I could talk about kind of the one I'm currently uh, most active on that I've been using AI for, for the most, uh, which is a, an offer in the stop smoking space uh, where, you know, I, I recently quit smoking. I kind of coached my wife through quitting finally as well after five or six failed attempts. Um, and it's kind of just a really, I'm not going to reveal what the angle is, but it's a, it's a unique way of, of quitting smoking that I haven't seen anybody else talk about. Right. But again, there's, this was a topic where I am not a certified hypnotist or, or stop smoking coach or behavioral therapist or, or any of that kind of thing. Right. But I can take this method that I've come up with and using AI, I can find the proof and the justifications and explain logically why it works and create a unique mechanism with it and come up with an offer for it and go into what is a, you know, it's a big market, right? There's a lot of people uh, try, trying to quit smoking. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a market that I probably would not have entered before due to that feeling of lack of credentials, lack of expertise, that kind of thing. So there's stuff like that. It could be a niche that I know nothing about. Like let's say sewing, right? I don't have to be the expert. I can create, uh, I can go to mid journey and create a picture of a lady that looks, you know, 50 years old and wearing an apron with a cookbook and, and making a, a rack of lamb, right? And she could be my author and I could then put up a blog with articles created by her, which, you know, now it would, you know, I don't have to duplicate anybody's voice. It's a, it's a unique avatar. It's a unique expert author um, that's never going to quit. That's never going to demand a higher percentage. That's never going to ask for benefits, take vacation, right? It's like, it's like the holy grail of what we've always wanted employees to be. Um, and, you know, and part of the reason, you know, especially in the expert space, like in the expert space, you used to either have to be the one that had that subject matter expertise or you had to find somebody and partner with them. Now you don't. Now you can create that, that expert uh, avatar on the fly. Whether you reveal it's an avatar or not is a whole different ethical question. But, you know, as long as you verify that the content is accurate, it's no different than writing under a pen name or having a ghostwriter write your book. Same, same kind of model. Yeah, the ethics there are interesting. Um, and I'm sure there will be uh, all kinds of court cases and regulations in the future that will help figure that stuff out. So I want to ask kind of a, a wild card question, Teddy, sure. um, because as we see everything sort of trending towards automation and AI is going to replace, you know, all of these potentially replace all of these positions. Do you see the pendulum swing back in any case where people will start to value human created content or human created programming? Almost, I'm thinking like, you know, you can get uh, a purse or a bag, you know, that's machine made at, you know, Walmart or, or Macy's or whatever, and you're paying anywhere from say 10 to $300. And then you've got a maker like Saddleback Leather that's, you know, creating these handmade bags that are, you know, literally, you know, at least double that price and sometimes four or five times that price. I'm wondering if there's 
a similar thing that will happen eventually with content creation, design, art, anything that, you know, that AI is doing. What do you think about that? Or is the AI just going to be so good that we don't value those kinds of marketing applications from people anymore? Yeah. So I'm not sure that we're going to be able to see or justify the value per se in content, right? Meaning like, you know, do we not go watch the latest Transformers movie because it's CGI, right? Versus real, yeah. real stunt people. Um, obviously, that's not the case. So, so I think you know whether AI creates the movie or whether there's an actual director behind the camera shooting the film. I think as long as it's a good film, we'll watch it and be entertained and not really care. I think where there will be a premium on on human interaction will be for things potentially like support and potentially like coaching, right? Where, okay, like this, this bot is only getting me so far, but you know, I want to see your face. I want to feel your, your expressions, all that kind of stuff. But so the good news is that that means we're going to be able to charge a ridiculous premium for that. Those of us that have this, this sort of expertise in a particular topic, but ideally we should be able to generate more revenue, uh, without sacrificing more of our time, right? So the, the AI or the chat interface or whatever the interface is going to be, because I think, you know, voice is next and then 3D and, and metaverse is kind of after that, right? But yeah, I, so I think there'll be ways to monetize our, our knowledge and our expertise in ways that are more scalable than we have now, but then there will be a premium for when it's really our time being used up. Okay, well, that gives me some hope. Uh, a little bit of hope. So thanks for that. <laughs> um, my, my last question for you is just, you teased the matrix earlier. So can you just kind of share your vision for reality related to the matrix? Yeah. So I do think that as the metaverse, let me back up a little bit. Like, you know, the thing that we're seeing and, and the reason that I believe that uh, chat GPT has had the massive adoption that it's had is because it has changed the interface between humans and computers, right? So the same way that we started off with punch cards and then we got keyboards and then we went to mouse and then we went to a mobile device and now we're going to a chat interface and eventually we're going to go to a voice interface and then eventually we'll get to a neural link interface, right? So yeah, I think the, the concept of the matrix of being plugged in and being able to download uh, information or, or have other people tap into our actual thoughts or brains or thinking, uh, like, is that going to happen? Yeah, I think it is. I think, especially given that Musk is the one working on it uh, with the Neuralink uh, that he just got FDA approval for. Uh, and the fact that he's managed to bring to life all of his other crazy ideas. Um, I think there's no doubt we're, we're headed there. That doesn't mean that we're going to be living in pods in, in sticky serum, keeping us alive and, and we're not going to exist, but it does mean that, you know, we might eventually have a USB port in the back of our head if we want to, <laughs> to plug in and, and download or upload information, uh, as needed. Um, and I think that, you know, as we get in more into the metaverse, like if you started playing Madden uh, when you were a kid on Nintendo and you play Madden now on the PlayStation, like how realistic it is, like just imagine what that's going to be like in the metaverse, like how real it will look and feel. And you can't tell me that it's not going to be very close to reality. Well, if I have a neural link that's linked directly into Madden so that I think and it and you know the pass is made or there's like that would be kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm not sure that I want a neural link, but <laughs> I, I might be talked into it if uh, if it becomes That's the that sales one. message for yeah, Rob. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, and and again like you know the and that was like even just going back to interface like right that's that's one of the things that Apple is changing with its its headset not not the fact that you can kind of see the fake eyes, uh, which is kind of creepy in my opinion, but the fact that you no longer need the controllers, right? That it's monitoring your hand movement and your hands become real world, like, you know, Iron Man, grab screens, pinch to make wider, 
drag tool, you know, like that interface change of how we interact with applications is going to be huge, right? It's going to take a while for it's 3,500 bucks, like, you know, but it's inevitable that that's going to happen. And it's inevitable that I think the reality uh, that's experienced inside the metaverse will be pretty close to matching the reality we experience here. And that's when we start questioning the whole matrix thing, but matrix is coming for all of us. So <laughs> uh, it's time to get ready. Yeah. So Teddy, thanks for taking the time to walk through how you're using AI and just thinking about things a little bit differently than what I think at least a lot of content creators so far have been thinking about it. It's been um, interesting and again, got my brain going about some things that I want to try and do a little bit differently. My pleasure. I appreciate you guys having me on. And, and yeah, the key takeaway is just really, you know, understanding the bigger picture and like, what else can I use this for other than client work or just creating content and just using it more in your personal life. So just getting in the habit of when you have a question, the same way you went to Google when you had a question, like now you can go to chat. Right. And so like, even with my son the other day, who's 19 and is kind of trying to figure out what, what the heck he wants to do in life. Like I just wrote a prompt in chat that was like starting to ask him the questions that a career counselor would ask to get him some specific advice and guidance based on his personality type and you know, what he might be best suited for. And that's, that's available to us now for free. Right. And Teddy, for anyone listening who may want to quit smoking or just connect with you and hear about your 299 other ideas where can they go to connect with you uh yeah so they can go to uh, they can go to my agency website which is infomarketingsystem.com and from there they can they can opt in they can grab one of one of my books and some other presentations i've got on automation from there they can book a call and stuff like that if they want to chat all right, we want to thank Teddy Garcia for joining us on the podcast to talk about the opportunity to use AI to take new businesses from start to finish using the seven buckets of tech tools that are available to all of us. You can connect with Teddy if you want to learn more from Teddy or just become buds at infomarketingsystem.com. And once again, if you want to explore our course, AI for Copywriters course slash adventure, you can go to thecopywriterclub.com forward slash AI for C. And that's the end of this episode of AI for Creative Entrepreneurs, a Copywriter Club podcast produced by Brandon Burton. If you've enjoyed today's episode, and I hope that you did, please leave a review of the show on your podcast app. Or if you're catching us on YouTube, you can like this video, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment below to let us know your favorite takeaway from this show. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.